Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a special grand round that will be combined with the newly launched Stanford Medicine Building a Culture of Health Equity lecture series. I'm so excited to get going with today's presentation. Um, however, just a first, a few reminders. First of all, our regular COVID updates will resume next week. And I do wanna take a moment to honor a fallen colleague. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bill Robinson for a few remarks before we get started. Great, thank you so much. Um, two weeks ago, Sam Strober passed and um, Bob Harrington said a couple nice words, but I just wanted to add a few more words to that. Um, Sam was a long-standing Stanford um, faculty member. He originally uh, was the son of Ukrainian immigrants, and he grew up in Brooklyn, New York, before going to Columbia and Harvard Medical School and training at Mass General. He then went to the NIH and came to Stanford in the early 60s, in 1963. Uh, he, his research program and clinical program succeeded and he became the chief of the division of immunology and rheumatology in 1979 and was division chief for almost 20 years. Um, he really pioneered um, chimerism for transplantation tolerance. And this is kind of um, featured in this New England Journal of Medicine paper from um, Sam's team that included many close colleagues in bone marrow transplant in which they uh, develop methods for making renal transplant recipients uh, chimeras in terms of bone marrow chimeras and such that they could accept their transplants without requiring continued immunosuppressive therapy, uh, which was is very transformational and is now being extended and with the potential to implement it more widely in, in clinical practice. Um, so S S Sam worked almost up to the very end. As, as Bob said last week, he even wrote a major program project just like literally three and a half weeks ago. Um, but he had been battling with multiple myeloma for uh, about a year and a half for two years and ultimately succumbed to that in, in a very rapid downturn, but had a very high quality of life right up to the end. We will be having a celebration of life, working with his family and colleagues from bone marrow transplant in the spring of this year. And we will be providing a notifications when, when that event is, is formally scheduled. So with that, um, remembering Sam Strober. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Um, here we are at the end of Black History Month. We have had amazing lectures throughout the entire month. And I'm here to tell you again, that our department is committed to celebrate and elevate Black voices beyond the short month of February. Last week, we had a great discussion on episode one of the 1619 Project. Please be on the lookout for an episode two discussion in the near future, as well as a great lineup for Women's History Month in March. I wanna remind everyone to put their questions and comments in the Q&A, and please feel free to vote up those questions that you would prefer to be answered live. And with that, I'm very excited to hand it over to Dr. Terrence Mays, one of the leaders of the Building a Culture of Health Equity Lecture Series to introduce our very special guest and our regular updates will return next week. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dunn. And hello everyone, it's good to see you all. Um, let me just get my notes uh, going here. So I also thank you for joining us for this very special uh, Stanford Medicine Building a Culture of Health Equity Lecture, uh, which is joined with the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. And as Dr. Dunn said, uh, my name is Terrence Mays, and I am the Associate Dean for Equity and Strategic Initiatives, as well as the Executive Director of our Commission on Justice and Equity here at Stanford Medicine. Uh, this series, the Building a Culture of Health Equity program, is organized by the Stanford Medicine Office of Continuing Medical Education, um, the Stanford Medicine Health Equity Committee, and also the Stanford Medicine Reach Initiative, Racial Equity to Advance a Community of Health. And the monthly lecture series will highlight education, research, innovation that work together towards ensuring all individuals uh, receive equal priority and the highest level of care uh, so that together 
as a community, we're building a culture of health equity here at Stanford and across our nation. Let me get to my next slide. So I want to introduce uh, our guest speaker, but first a little housekeeping. Uh, as Dr. Dunn said, we do invite you to use the Q&A button if you would like to submit a question. Um, and you can do this at any point in the lecture, and we'll do our best to get to your question during the Q&A segment. Also, if you happen to experience any technical issues, please use the chat function and someone on our team will assist you. Uh, in the spirit of collaboration, I thought I'd mention just very quickly uh, the three upcoming grand rounds for the Department of Medicine. You see those uh, now on your screen, uh, and I hope you're looking forward to those as well uh, as, as much as I am. Uh, and then in terms of the Building a Culture of Health Equity program, uh, to stay up to date on these lectures as well as other opportunities, please visit healthequity.stanford.edu. Uh, in March, we look forward to hosting uh, Mary Stutz, who is the Global Chief, Chief Inclusion and Health Equity Officer at Real Chemistry. And she will be our Women's History Month uh, distinguished speaker. Uh, so please join us for that. Uh, I am also happy to share that we will host a full day of building a culture of health equity summit on May 19th. And this summit will explore health equity through the lenses of education, uh, research, clinical care, as well as community and civic engagement. Um, Again, you can learn more on our website, uh, including finding information about our call for proposals, which is now open. Uh, and we invite you all uh, here to consider submitting an abstract. Uh, if you need to claim CE credit for participating in today's lecture, uh, please follow the information that you see on your screen now. Uh, and I'll pause a moment in case anyone needs to jot that down. Okay, so it is now my distinct honor uh, and privilege to introduce and actually welcome back uh, one of our very own, a graduate of the Stanford Medicine MD program and someone that I and many, many others around the world have been inspired by for years, Kamara. Phyllis Jones uh, is a family physician, epidemiologist, and the past president of the American Public Health Association, whose work focuses on naming, measuring, and addressing the impacts of racism on health and the well being of our nation and the world. Dr. Jones is currently the 2021 22 UCSF presidential chair at the University of California, San Francisco. She just completed her role as a 2021 uh, Presidential Visiting Fellow at the Yale School of Medicine, and as the 2019-20 Evelyn Green Davis Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Dr. Jones taught six years as an assistant professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, served for 14 years as a medical officer at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and she continues as an adjunct professor at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University and as a senior fellow and adjunct associate professor at the Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Jones has been teaching us about race and racism before it was popular uh, and sort of commonplace to do so. Uh, her allegories on race and racism illuminate in a way that I believe no one else does. Topics that are otherwise difficult for many Americans to understand or even discuss. Uh, recognizing that racism saps the strength of the whole society uh, through the waste of human capital and human resources. Dr. Jones aims to mobilize and engage all of us uh, in a sustained national campaign against racism. Today, we are honored uh, to have you here, Dr. Jones, as our Black History Month uh, distinguished lecturer. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be back home 
at Stanford, at Stanford Medicine, and um, to have this opportunity really to share some of my allegories and frames for um, naming racism and moving to action. Now you'll notice that I put a little confronting racism denial above that title, and I'm gonna say a bit about that in a minute, but recognizing that this is a CME um, event as well, I need to say I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. And so on that notion of confronting racism denial, this is sort of at the edge of my thinking now that racism denial is actually like a black hole in our national landscape, like black holes in the universe. So black holes in the universe, you know, are massive, they're powerful, they suck everything into them, but they're invisible, we can't see them. The reason we can't see them is that even when light comes near, it gets sucked in. And in the same way, racism denial is operating in our society, staunchly held by so many and, and invalidating our efforts, our anti-racism efforts, which have been newly invigorated in this country after the recognition of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, and after the gruesome murder of Mr. George Floyd, but so many before and so many after him, there has been a, a reawakening, a re-recognition that racism exists by some, but there are still many who are in staunch racism denial. And so in addition to our efforts to dismantle structures, to address negative uh, you know, dehumanizing value systems, I think that in our work, we need to squarely confront racism denial, recognize that, that, that uh, loving of comfort as a value, as opposed to valuing social justice is just one more reflection of racism denial. So I'm gonna keep coming back to that in my, um, in my remarks. But let me say that six years ago in 2016, I was the president of the American Public Health Association. And in that role, I launched our association, our 54 state affiliates, state and other affiliates, you know, as many communities and other professional organizations as would join us in 2016 on a national campaign against racism with three tasks. The first being, of course, to name racism because we must name a problem in order to get started on the solution. But as necessary as it is to name racism, it's necessary but insufficient. We have to go beyond that and move to action. So the second of the three tasks of this national campaign against racism is to ask the question, how is racism operating here? To identify levers for intervention, targets for action. And then after we've done that landscaping, we must organize and strategize to act. Because yes, we have power as individuals to, to use the tools at our disposal to recognize our own power, but collective action is a much stronger superpower because collective action informs us, it inspires us, it propels us, it protects us. So as I talk about these three, um, these three tasks for a national campaign against racism, which I'm hoping is going to be a sustained national campaign against race, racism, that, that we're not in a moment, but a movement, as many have said, we have to recognize that this anti-racism is actually a process and it's iterative. So once we name racism, we're not done with that. We have to name racism, ask how is racism operating here, organize and strategize again, and then repeat, <laughs> name racism. And it's an intergenerational process. I hope I, in our questions, we can get to that. So for the first part of this in the naming racism part of it, in this confronting racism denial part of it, there are four key messages. The first is to recognize and communicate to others that yes, racism exists. The second is that racism is a system. The third is that racism saps the strength of the whole society. And the fourth is that yes, we can act to dismantle racism. So I'm going to share with you three of my allegories today to help us understand those four key messages. This first story that I call dual reality, a restaurant saga was actually sparked by an experience I had as a first year medical student at Stanford. So I'm going to have you walk with me in my experience, but this is going to be a story about racism and especially to help people understand that yes, racism exists. So here I was, first year medical student, very studious, very diligent, 
on this Saturday, like most Saturdays, I had awakened early and I had hit the books, nose in, studying hard. Comes to be about mid-afternoon and some of my friends come over. Do they distract me from my studies? Oh no, oh no, we all get together studying together long and hard and now it's getting late and we're getting hungry and I have no food in my apartment, which was so typical that my friends, they understood, they were like, okay, never mind, Kamara, but we're hungry. So let's go into town and find something to eat. So we do, we go into Palo Alto, we you know, go into town. I usually don't say the, the town, you know, but here we are. So we go into town and we find a restaurant. We walk in and we sit down and the menus are presented and we order our food and the food is served here, we are eating. So people of my generation might've thought, oh, they, they might've thought I was going with a different story about racism in a restaurant, but yes, we're served here, we are eating. But as I, there is a story about racism in here. So as I sat there eating with my friends, I looked across the room and I noticed a sign that was a startling revelation to me about racism. So now maybe I've intrigued you. And you're wondering, okay, Dr. Jones, what did the sign say? Well, what did the sign say? The sign said open. So now maybe I've lost many of you because you're confused. How is that a startling revelation about racism? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, let me recap. Here we are. I have to take a drink of water. Hold on. Here we are. <clears throat> sitting in this restaurant eating. I look up, I see a sign that says open, thinking no more about it. I would assume other hungry people could walk in, sit down, order their food and eat, right? But because I knew something about the two-sided nature of those signs, I recognized that now indeed the restaurant was closed due to the hour, but firmly closed. And that other hungry people just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of that sign would not be able to come in, sit down, order their food and eat. And that's when I recognized that racism structures open closed signs in our society. That racism structures, if you will, and hold on, I need to just move a little bit of something. That racism structures, if you will, a dual reality. And for those who are inside the restaurant at the table of opportunity eating, and they look up and they see a sign that says open, they don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on because it is difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. So for example, it is difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It's difficult for white Americans to recognize white privilege and racism. In fact, it's difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context. Although people, we are living it really large right now with how much of the global supply of COVID-19 vaccine we have sequestered in this nation. Now, those on the outside are very well aware that there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims close to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So back inside the restaurant, to those who ask, is there really a two-sided sign going on? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard for you to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege, not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism. It's actually an empowering thing to name racism. It doesn't even compel you to act but it does equip you to act so that if you care about those on the other side of the sign, which is an if, but if you do, why, why you could even talk to the restaurant owner who is after all inside with you. You could say restaurant owner, there are hungry people outside. Why don't you open the door and let them come in? You'll make more money and all oh, the conversations we could have. Or maybe what you'll do is pass some food through the window or maybe you'll try to tear down the sign or break through the door, but at least what you won't be doing is sitting back saying, huh, wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat? Because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of that sign that proclaims open to you. So when I have just five or so minutes to speak to an audience to equip them with a tool or even with the basic understanding that yes, racism exists, that it's, a, it's a creating a two-sided sign or multi-sided. This is the story that I tell. And in fact, I have actually on two different occasions started three-hour conversations each time with the following question. 
how could people who were born inside the restaurant know something about the two-sided nature of that sign? And each time when I asked that question, it was a three-hour conversation afterward because there are many ways to know. But let me say this, I am heartened that more people who were born inside the restaurant and just two years ago might've been sitting eating and saying, huh, what are those people outside saying? Black lives matter, don't they know all lives matter? More of those people are now actually affirming, yes, black lives matter. More people who were born inside the restaurant are saying the word racism, putting together the phrases structural racism or systemic racism. This is really heartening. But let me tell you, I had to give you a warning. If all that we do is say the word racism, as important as it is to name a problem in order to get started on the solution, we may in six months forget why we said that thing because racism denial is so staunchly held in this nation and it's so seductive that if we just put something on our web page, you know, institutional web page or our Facebook or we tweet something out, six months from now, we may fall back into what I describe as the sleepiness, the somnolence of racism denial. So we must go beyond any racism to action. We need to tear down the sign. And of course, racism is not just a sign. It's the sign, it's the door, it's a lock. There's a whole system going on. We need to dismantle the lock, take the door off the hinges because once we start acting, we will not forget why we are acting. So that's my story that I hope you will remember and share with somebody in your family, somebody in your workplace, a neighbor, to help them understand, help all of us understand that racism is structuring two-sided or multi-sided science is creating a dual or multifaceted reality in this society. And that same sign that proclaims open and reassures many of us that this is the land of equal opportunity is a two-sided sign and it is closing things to others. So now I know I owe you a, def a definition of racism. So when I say the word racism, I'm clear that I'm talking about a system. So I am not talking about an individual character flaw or a personal moral failing or even a psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested. And yes, racism shows up in all of those ways, yes. But in its essence, it's a system of power. And a system of doing what? It's a system of doing two things, structuring opportunity and assigning value. And on what basis is the opportunity structured? And on what basis is the value assigned based on the social interpretation of how one looks in this race conscious society? That is what we call race. Race, I know everybody listening to, to me now or in the future will understand, hopefully understand deeply, know that race is not written in our genes. Race, the same race that becomes part of health statistics is the same on the street race that people, you know, kind of check you off as without even asking, how do you self-identify? Or where were you born? Where were your parents born? Or even, may I have a little aliquot of your blood? I have a genetic hypothesis. It's the same race that turns into health statistics. It's the same race that a taxi driver notices or a judge in a courtroom or a teacher in a classroom, right? The same race that a police officer notices. And it's that race that has profound impacts on our life opportunities and life exposure stresses and all. So this race, this socially assigned race, this so-called street race, this social interpretation of how one looks in our race conscious society is the substrate on which racism operates day to day and across the centuries to structure opportunity and assign value. And so what are the impacts of this system of racism? Well, when we do recognize that racism exists in this country, then we usually understand that yes, racism is unfairly disadvantaging some individuals and communities. But it shouldn't take any of us long to recognize that every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage so that racism is also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. And that's the whole issue of unearned white privilege that we hardly ever talk about in this country because it makes some people, especially some people who are living as white, uncomfortable. And I used to almost apologize for that little bit of discomfort, you know, when we were in, in real life, Bill, you know, and I could see people start to shift and all like that, I would say, oh, I'm not trying to make anybody uncomfortable. Stay with me. I'll tell you more stories. I don't apologize for that discomfort anymore. What I say instead is if you feel uncomfortable acknowledging 
unearned white privilege, I encourage you to lean into that discomfort by reading history, by going across town and staying a while, by digging in deeply, because I have come to recognize that for all of us, the edge of our comfort is actually our growing edge. But there's a third impact of racism that many of us miss. And that is that racism saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Many examples of that, how we're not vigorously investing in, a, in the full, excellent public education of all of our children. Because some people think, you know, with the blinders, they think there's no genius in the barrios on the reservations in the ghettos. We can get along very well, thank you, without those kids. And of course, there is genius in all of our communities. And if we were to only vigorously invest in that genius, we could be doing so much better as a nation or even as a world. Those same blinders that don't value all of us equally have made us as a nation complacent with what I describe as a wholesale warehousing disproportionately of so many black and brown men in our prison system as if that didn't separate us from human potential. Many ways. And I think that this third impact, how racism saps the strength of the whole society actually should be the one that we are elevating in these days and times. We need more media stories about that. We need more conversations around our faculty tables or our boardroom tables or around our dining room tables so that more people are filled with a sense of urgency to dismantle the system and put in its place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potentials. But, um, and I would love to, you know, I am at risk of talking deeply into my slides. I just wanna say one more thing before I go on, but I'm gonna try to reserve at least 10 minutes for our Q&A. But, um, you know, there are many people in this country who resist acknowledging unfair advantage. And they would describe two states of being, yes, but they would describe them as disadvantaged and normal. And the reason that many people in this country would describe these two states of being as being disadvantaged and normal is that we as a nation are ahistorical. We act as if the present were disconnected from the past and as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a ha happenstance. And people do not recognize that their so-called normal is built up on a whole mountain of unfair advantage. Now, in order to understand how this system can turn into health outcomes, differences in the numbers of our babies dying before their first birthday by race, the infant mortality rate differences, or differences in the maternal mortality rates, three to eight times, uh, depending on where you are in the country, higher maternal mortality for black women, indigenous women compared to white women, around what should be the happiest time in their lives, right? Or differences in obesity prevalence or differences in renal failure, differences in diabetes prevalence and, and all of that, those things which were pre-existing conditions that made it more likely if you got infected with COVID that you would die from it. I mean, so how could racism turn into these things? And I think it's useful to understand racism on three levels to explain that. Institutionalized or structural, personally mediated, which you know, that's, I call it personally mediated. Other people might call that interpersonal racism, but I'm so clear that racism is a system that I say it's personally mediated because it's a system mediated through people and then internalized. So let me define each of these levels of racism, give you examples of how they can impact health and then illustrate them with the second allegory that I'm gonna share with you, my Gartner's tale allegory. So institutionalized or structural racism is the system. It's the constellation of structures, policies, practices, norms, and values that all put together result in differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. So this is the kind of racism that doesn't require an identifiable perpetrator because it's been institutionalized in our laws and customs and background norms. This is the kind of racism that shows up as inherited disadvantage or it's reciprocal inherited advantage. We see this level of racism both in material conditions and in access to power. So examples include differential access by race to quality housing or excellent educational opportunities or equal employment opportunities, or even the same level of income at the same level of employment. And that clearly these things can impact health. Differential access to medical facilities. It could be physical access, financial access, linguistic access. Differential access to a clean environment and the very well-documented disproportionate placement, for example, of toxic dump sites or bus transfer stations in communities of color. And 
in terms of access to power, differential access to power as information. It could be health information or even information about our own histories. Power as resources, capital resources, but also social networking resources, knowing somebody on the board. Power as voice in government and media and the like. And now, usually at about this point, and I saw that we got a Q&A, so I can't see what the question is, but usually at about this point in my presentations, somebody will say, excuse me, Dr. Jones, but take a close look at that top set of examples that you have there, housing, education, employment, income. Dr. Jones, isn't that what we call social class? Why do you have that on a slide about racism? Are you talking about racism or are you really, really talking about social class? And that's such an important question that I am going to address it right now. And the first part of my answer is the observation that it doesn't just so happen that people of color in this country are overrepresented in poverty, while white people in this country are overrepresented in wealth. That is not just a happenstance. And for each marginalized, stigmatized, oppressed group of color, there's been some initial historical injustice. I'm so sorry, there is this you know, weather um, alert. I'm gonna have to mute myself for a minute. If I can find the mute, I can't even find it. Okay, anyway, but well, there it is. That was a test of the national weather system. Anyway, as I was saying, for each marginalized or stigmatized or oppressed group of color, there's been some initial historical injustice and they are emergencies, right? But so for example, American Indians, for indigenous North Americans, the initial historical injustice was the taking of the land. And then the neo genocide, and then the moving of the survivors to reserved lands. And then in some instances, something good was found under one reservation. Oops, you got to pick the, pick the people up and move them someplace else. We know that for centuries, there have been families that lived in Mexico who never crossed the border, but the border crossed them. And they find themselves in New Mexico and Arizona, Texas, California. And their, the great great grandchildren are still being vilified, harassed you know, in the, the uh, El Paso massacre targeted, right? We have had really the, the across the Pacific slavery and the importation of Chinese laborers to build our, you know, intercontinental railroad system. And then with the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1880s, those laborers were unable by law to bring their families over, unable by law to marry. We had, the internment of Japanese Americans in World War II without the internment of German Americans, Italian Americans. And for people of African descent, the initial historical injustice was the kidnapping of West African people, our importation across the Atlantic with tremendous loss of life in the Middle Passage. And then for the survivors and their progeny for generations and generations and generations, what I describe as the coerced usury of our unpaid labor for centuries to build this country. But now you're listening to me there and like people in the past have been like, oh, Dr. Jones, there you go talking about slavery. Dr. Jones, we all recognize that slavery was an unfortunate chapter in our nation's history. And sometimes people don't even recognize that. But Dr. Jones, we in this conversation all recognize that. But Dr. Jones, the enslaved people were emancipated by 1865. We are in 2022. That makes that 157 years ago. So Dr. Jones, all else being equal, don't you think the impacts of slavery would have washed out by now? Well, the answer is in the question, isn't it? All else being equal. All else has not been equal since 1865 and all else still is not equal today. And there are what I describe as present day contemporary structural factors that are perpetuating each of those initial historical injustices that I hope you heard over my emergency, you know, test of the emergency system. But so these contemporary structural factors are actually part and parcel of structural racism. So when you ask me, am I talking about social class or am I talking about racism? The answer is actually that structural racism explains why we see an association between social class and race in this country. It is not just a happenstance, right? This is an important aha. I wanna say one more thing because sometimes people say, oh, Dr. Jones, you talk so much about racism. You don't care about poor white people, do you? And I do, I deeply care about poor white people. 
poor black people, poor indigenous people, poor Hispanic or Latino, Latino people, poor Asian people, poor native Hawaiian, other Pacific Islander people, poor all kinds of people that do a Middle Eastern, North African, whatever kind of labels you want to throw in there. I care about poor all people. And this is not an either or. Let me tell you something. If we had a magic wand today to eliminate poverty and we do uh, the build back better, all that legislation that hasn't passed yet, but that legislation could be a huge impact on, on poverty, on poverty in this nation. Well, if you gave me a magic wand, ding, I would do that. I would eliminate poverty in this nation. If you gave me a magic wand that with a ding, ding could do two things and I could eliminate income inequality, I would go all the way there. But if I did that without addressing the background structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, the mechanisms of structural or institutionalized racism, then even if I eliminated incoming inequality across the board today, within one generation, we would start to see a stratification by race again in terms of income. This is not an either or anti-poverty or anti-racism struggle. This is a both and approach that we must have. One more thing I wanna say before I leave this slide, this is perhaps the most important slide in my talk, so I'm not concerned about staying here so long, that structural racism can occur through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission. And very often structural racism shows up as lack of action, inaction in the face of need. The second level of racism, personally mediated racism, I define as differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions. So this is what most people think of when they hear the word racism, somebody did something to somebody. It does include the prejudice, the different idea and the discrimination, the different action and all of the you know, implicit bias or unconscious bias, all of that is wrapped up in here. How could it impact health? Well, police brutality, uh, you know, which affects not just the loss that of the life or the, the, the maiming from that police brutality, it's not just the individual, it's not just the family that's affected, it's whole communities because so many communities are just bracing ourselves for the next occurrence because for the most part, there's been very limited accountability for the perpetrators of police brutality or even as we had, you know, thank goodness there's been accountability for the murder of Mr. Ahmad Arbery, for the murder of Mr. George Floyd, but that is not justice, right? So anyway, uh, you can tell I can go deep in that. I'm not going to. Physician disrespect. Here I'm going to go a little deep. Physician disrespect can be as subtle as a physician not giving a patient the full range of treatment options because the physician, me, you, us, might assume that that patient couldn't afford or wouldn't comply or wouldn't understand or whatever they assume about that patient. Or physician disrespect can be as blatant as sterilization abuse, which has had many iterations in our nation's history. Shopkeeper vigilance being followed around in stores, waiter indifference, not getting quick, respectful treatment. These are just, those two are elements of what some people call everyday racism, the subtle communication of disrespect, the microaggressions that don't feel so micro to those who have been addressed. And teacher devaluation, very important. If a teacher looks at a young child and thinks that child can't learn and puts them off in the you know, attention deficit disorder track, that child will never even know their full potential, much less have the ability to develop to their full potential. Like structural racism, personally mediated racism can be through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission. But even more important to recognize at this level is that it can be unintentional as well as intentional. You do not have to have intended to do something racist to have had a racist impact. The third level of racism, internalized racism, I usually, for years, for years, only had it on my slide from the point of view of members of stigmatized races, where it shows up as acceptance of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. But I do acknowledge that people who have been structurally advantaged also internalize racism where it manifests there as a sense of entitlement. And I am not putting it on my slide just, to, just so that we can understand that this is not just uh, a, a one-way type of thing of internalization. And especially because this sense of entitlement I've come to recognize requires racism denial. You know, I've talked about racism denial as this huge black hole. Well, if you feel that your situation is normal and that you are entitled to it, you have to deny that there is an unfair system going on. I will, for the rest of this slide, talk about uh, 
internalized racism again, though, from the point of view of members to stigmatize racists, because I actually don't know how a sense of entitlement can turn to bad health outcomes, unless I will have to say, unless what you have is a sense of entitlement thwarted, in which case maybe that is related to what some people have described as the, the diseases of despair, <laughs> the diseases of despair in white populations, the despair of a sense of entitlement thwarted. So including you know, the suicide, the um, opioid epidemic and the like. But from the point of view of members of stigmatized races, this level of racism, internalized racism shows up as self-devaluation, feeling maybe I'm really not as good as, maybe I shouldn't try to graduate from high school. Maybe I shouldn't try to apply to that college or try to get that job or live in that neighborhood. It turns into what my parents' generation called the white man's ice is colder syndrome, which Many of us in my generation and younger people today still hold on to. So how does that show up? Well, say I'm black and I need a lawyer. I may actually go out of my way to seek out a white lawyer over a black lawyer. Or if I'm sick, I might prefer the white doctor over the black doctor if I could find a black doctor. Or if I am black and my lemonade is warm, I may go all the way down the street to get the white man's ice over the black man's ice, deeply believing that the white man's ice is colder, deeply internalizing the myth of white superiority. It turns into resignation, helplessness, hopelessness, which turns into a lot of self-destructive health behaviors and really is about members of all of the stigmatized races. This is not just a black white thing. I have to just be clear, you know, that racism is affecting many, many groups in this nation. It's a, a acceptance by those of us who've been stigmatized of the limitations to our own full humanity of the box into which we have been placed. So now I'm going to share with you an allegory, my Gartner's Tale allegory, and I'm gonna briefly stop sharing so that I'm larger on your screen because if you think I've been using my hands a lot uh, before, I'm gonna really use them now. This allegory is to illustrate these three levels of racism and then to help us understand how do we move forward. It's based on something that happened in my own real life. I'm going to tell you what happened in my own real life, then make it a story about racism. My husband and I have been married about a year and we moved down to Baltimore for me to finish my PhD at Hopkins. And we bought our first freestanding house. Cute little house, big wraparound porch with flower boxes all on this dotting this porch. So, you know, we bought the house in October, not the time to plant, but when spring came, my husband who loves to garden ran out with our marigolds. He's gonna decorate our cute little house by planting our marigolds in all of these boxes. But he came right back in and he said, Kamara, you know, some of these boxes have dirt in them, but some of the boxes are empty. I need to go down to the gardening store. So he does, goes to the gardening store. He comes back hauling big old bags of potting soil. And then we take that potting soil and we fill up those empty boxes. And then we take our marigold seed and we sprinkle equal numbers of seeds in all of the boxes and we water all of the boxes equally. And then by that time, you know, because I'm not the gardener in the family, I'm exhausted. So I just sit back, gonna be delighted. Three weeks later, as I'm walking out of my front door onto my porch, I finally pay attention to these flower boxes. And what I saw made me literally stop in my tracks because what I saw made me think that we had planted completely different species in some boxes versus others. Some of the boxes were full of plants and the plants were tall and vigorous looking. And some of the boxes just had a few plants in them and they were scrawny and scraggly looking. And then I realized what had happened. That potting soil that we had bought turned out to be rich fertile soil so every single seed planted in the rich fertile soil has sprouted. Strong seed and grown very tall and vigorous, but even the weak seed had made it halfway up. But that old soil that we had found there turned out to be poor rocky soil. So the weak seed planted in the poor rocky soil just died. And even the strong seed in the poor rocky soil had to struggle to make it to a middling height. And maybe some of you guys are nodding because maybe you are a gardener too and you've composted half of your garden and you've seen this image with your own real eyes and you recognize that this image is about the importance of the soil, the importance of the environment. But now I'm gonna take this image and I'm going to make it a story about racism by introducing a gardener. So now I have a gardener who has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich fertile soil and one which she knows to have poor rocky soil. And she has seed for the same kind of flowers, except some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms and some of the seed is going to produce red blossoms and the gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She takes the red seed, puts it in the rich fertile soil, pink seed in the poor rocky soil. Three weeks later, she sees in her flower boxes what I saw in mine. In that rich fertile soil, all the, all the red seed has sprouted, strong red seed grows tall and vigorous, even the weak red seed makes it halfway up. In that poor rocky soil, the weak pink seed dies. Here comes the strong pink seed, struggling to make it to a middling height. And then in those two flower boxes, those flowers go to seed. 
And the next year, the same thing happens. And then those flowers go to seed. And year after year after year after year, the same thing happens until finally, oh, about 10 years later, Gardner's looking at her flower boxes and she says, you know, I was right to prefer red over pink. So we're gonna interrupt the story to say the first part of this story illustrates how structural or institutionalized racism works. Where you have the initial historical injustice of the separation of the seed into the two types of soil. You have the contemporary structural factors of the flower boxes keeping the soil separate. And then through lack of action, inaction in the face of need, perpetuation of the inequity. But where would personally mediated racism be in the garden? Well, the gardener's looking at the red flowers thinking, oh, red is so beautiful. And then she looks at the pink flowers and she says, well, those pink flowers sure are scrawny and scraggly. So she plucks off the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed. Or maybe she notices that a pink seed has blown into the rich fertile soil. And so she plucks it out before it can establish itself, which is some of the anti-affirmative action stuff that goes on. And where would internalized racism be in the garden? Well, the red flowers are just living their lives, enjoying being red, many of them not acknowledging or perhaps not even recognizing that they're benefiting from enriched soil. The pink flowers are looking over at the red flowers, thinking red is mighty fine and wishing with all their hearts that they too could be red. And here come the bees, minding their own business, collecting nectar, but pollinating at the same time. So here comes, some, comes a bee bzz, into one of the pink flowers, and then bzz, to another pink flower, and bzz, to this pink flower, and this flower's like, get away from me, bee. Don't bring me any of that pink pollen. I prefer the red, because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So now the question arises, what do we do to set things right in this garden? Well, we could start by addressing the internalized racism. So we can go over to the pink flowers and say, pink is beautiful, power to the pink. And that is an important intervention. But if that's all we do, it's not gonna change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. So you might say, okay, okay, well, let's, let's address the personally mediated racism. Let's have a conversation with the gardener or better yet, let's have a workplace multicultural workshop for the gardener. So we do. And so, you know, in this workshop, we say, dear Gartner, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? And maybe she will, and maybe she won't. But even if she does, it's still not going to change the situation in which those pink flowers find themselves. What we really need to do if we want to set things right in the garden is address the structural or institutionalized racism, which means we need to break down the boxes and mix up the soil. Or if you're not quite ready yet to you know, break down the boxes, then, you know, uh, we could keep separate boxes, although I don't like that idea. It makes it much easier for that same gardener to keep segregating resources going forward. But if we're going to keep separate boxes, it means that we have to enrich the poor rocky soil until it's as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when we do, the pink flowers will flourish. It will be looking beautiful, grand and glorious, so that in that intervention on the structural racism, we will have also addressed the internalized racism. Pink will not, no longer be looking over at red, thinking red is better or wanting to be red. And in that intervention on the structural, we may also address the personally mediated racism. Now, the original gardener may have to go to her grave preferring red over pink, but her children who grow up and see the flowers looking equally beautiful will be less likely to have that kind of attitude. So this story has been to illustrate these three levels of racism to strongly suggest that if we want to set things right, we need to at least address the structural racism, good to address all the levels at the same time. And when we do, the other levels may take care of themselves, right? But there's one question I haven't asked yet, which is who is the gardener? After all, the gardener is the one that I gave the power to decide, the power to act and control of resources, which are actually the elements of self-determination. So who is the gardener? Well, in the US context, the gardener includes government, right? That's a huge part of the gardener, but not the only part. Media, foundations, corporations, health systems, Communities, to the extent they have self-determination, but whoever the gardener is, it is dangerous when the gardener is allied with one group. I painted her red, that's why she prefers red over pink. And it's also dangerous when she's not concerned with equity, when she can look at her flower boxes and think that her garden is beautiful, thank you, because she's not even counting the pink flowers as part of her garden. So then the question arises, what do we do about the gardener? Do we make the gardener striped or polka dotted or fuchsia? Do the pink flowers have to grow or recruit their own gardener? So many questions can come out of this. I'm gonna share two with you quickly. I'm going to whiz through the rest of my material so I can answer your questions. But the two questions I have to share on the gardener's tale, the first was, and I got this question years ago, excuse me, Dr. Jones, but why should the red flowers share their soil? 
when I heard that question, I loved the question because it showed me the power of this story to start conversations about racism, which might be otherwise difficult when we're talking about racism between you and me. My answer to that question, why should the red flower share their soil? Is that actually that soil doesn't belong to the red flowers. It belongs to the whole garden. Here's a second question. What if that's not the original gardener we're looking at right there? What if that's the gardener's great, 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 great grandchild? Here we are. And the great, 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 great grandchild has always seen the flowers looking like that, may not even think that there's a problem to be solved. So in three quick steps, quick in the telling, not in the implementation, but in these three steps, first, we must make the differences in the height and vigor of the pink and red flowers a problem requiring urgent solution. Put it on our urgent action agenda. Second, in order to know, well, now what are we going to do? How do we act? We must make those flower boxes transparent. We must be talking about the differences in the quality of the soil. So we have to show the differences in the quality of the soil. Everybody needs to understand that. But number step number three is, as we make those flower boxes transparent, we need to make sure that everybody understands that the pink seed did not just go launch themselves into that poor rocky soil. So we must talk about history and we must talk about how the gardener's initial preference for red over pink set up the whole situation, right? Where in our setting, you know, people might call that preference for red over pink, cultural racism. In our US setting, it's clearly white supremacist ideology. We must address that directly because if we don't, even if we're able to compel that red gardener today to enrich the poor rocky soil today until it's as rich as the rich fertile soil today, if she continues to prefer red over pink, she will continue to privilege red over pink going forward. So when I defined racism as a system of doing two things, structuring opportunity and assigning value, we must address both of those aspects of racism. For many years, if you heard me tell the Gartner's tale a few years ago, this is new to you. Because for many years, I was just talking about the opportunity structure piece, but I now understand we must address both to set things right. Here's the third allegory, and I'm gonna quickly go through that and then race through the rest of it, and I'm sorry. Um, that we're already you know, at 52 past the hour. But this allegory is to help us understand two things. The first thing I'm gonna tell you now, the second thing at the end, this is to help us understand that racism is a system. And when I say cement dust in this allegory, I want you to think cement dust and I also want you to think racism. So imagine that there's a cement factory spewing cement dust and the cement dust fills the air. And if any of us are anywhere near this factory for any amount of time, we are going to develop cement dust in our lungs. And this cement dust in our lungs, lungs is problematic for all of us. Even for those who don't recognize they have cement dust in their lungs, even for the cement factory owner who will trade a little cement dust in her or his lungs for the profit. But it's, it's problematic for all of us, even though it might affect us differently. Maybe cement dust in my lungs makes me feel that I'm less than, whereas the cement dust in somebody else's lungs might make him feel that he can, with equanimity, crush the life out of another human being with his knee for nine minutes and 29 seconds. But recognizing that this is problematic for all of us, what do we do? How do we address it? Do we focus on the individual? Well, what would that look like? I'm gonna share with you two interventions. And I'm going to share with you that I'm not a big fan of the first one as the only intervention. But what if we set up some kind of screening machine, right? And to assess how much cement dust people had in their lungs, and then uh, uh, if somebody has too much cement dust in their lungs, an alarm goes off. Well, this machine might be useful for people who don't believe they have any cement dust in their lungs. But what are we going to do for those? How much is too much cement dust? What are we going to do with the people where the alarm goes off? put them to the edge of society, vote them off the island. And actually this kind of intervention actually makes some people hesitant to talk about cement dust at all. You know, some people, when they hear the word racism, think that you're trying to divide the room into who's racist and who's not, or peer deeply into their soul to ask exactly how racist are you. And so this might not be the best, especially if it was the only intervention, but maybe there are people who recognize they have cement dust in their lungs and they want to get it out. So maybe we could set up cleansing spas, trainings. And so somebody could choose to go in or be encouraged to go in and they could start reading history and speaking to other people and come back out as good as new. But if they come into that same cloud of dust, the dust is just gonna reaccumulate in their lungs. That cleansing spa is not a very permanent solution unless somebody goes and lives inside the cleansing spa. 
So what does that mean? Does that mean that we need to acknowledge the cloud? Well, what would that look like? Well, at least if I acknowledge the cloud, I know that the cement dust I have in my lungs, I wasn't born with that. I recognize it as because I'm living in this cloud of cement dust, and it's going to make me want to create a more permanent solution, maybe put on a, a gas mask, right, to filter out the cement dust from my lungs, recognizing that that in and of itself is not going to take the dust that's already in my lungs, but I recognize I need to keep this on 24-7. It's the start of my individual anti-racism journey. And I'm actually heartened when I see myself reflected in a mirror or a glass that, I, that the mask is still on, right? And when you all see me with the gas mask, you're going to ask, Dr. Jones, why are you wearing a gas mask? And I'm going to say, we're living in a cloud of cement dust. And then more and more of you may put on your own individual you know, gas mask, start your own individual anti-racism journeys. So is that the answer then? Is that the answer? You know, we have our things, we go around and we might name the cloud to other people. And then maybe we, do we need to develop 330 million gas masks? No baby size gas masks, old people gas masks? I think it's a start, but it's insufficient. We must dismantle the factory, which means that especially those of us who have started our own individual anti-racism journeys and have on a gas mask can, can see more clearly and can get a little closer to the factory, we need to get closer to the factory, which has been obscured for many other people by all the dust that has kicked up. They don't even know there's a factory in there. And then we need to ask, how is this factory operating here? Looking at structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. And then we need to organize and strategize to act to dismantle this factory and put in its place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potentials. So this story is not only that racism is a system, but it's also that we must address racism at the systems level if we're really going to have any impact. So that question, how is racism operating here? As I said, it was the second of three steps in the national campaign against racism. You know, it's a legitimate question because racism is not a cloud of miasma we can't get a handle on. It is a system with identifiable and addressable mechanisms in our structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. You're like, Dr. Jones, what am I gonna do with that? It seems like a headache until we recognize these are all the elements of decision-making. Structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision-making, especially who's at the table, who's not, what's on the agenda, what's not. Policies are the written how of decision-making. Both practices and norms are the unwritten how of decision-making. Practices, the way we do things now, we don't have to write that down. Norms, the way we've always done things and the way we expect you to do things today. And values are the why. And if we take this question, how is racism operating here? And just spend five or 10 or 15 minutes with that question, how is racism operating here in my workplace, at my child's daycare center, with regard to police killings of unarmed black and brown men and women, with anything within five, 10, 15 minutes, thinking about the who, what, when, where, why, and how of decision-making, we can identify levers for intervention, targets for action. I will not have time to share with you my three-part definition of health equity, just to say that it is a process and that there are three uh, principles for achieving health equity. If you think you're doing it, are you valuing all individuals and populations equally? Are you recognizing and rectifying historical injustices? And are you providing resources according to need? Seven barriers to achieving health equity. Um, our narrow focus on the individual that makes systems and structures invisible or irrelevant, our ahistorical stance, our endorsement of the myth of meritocracy, the story that if you work hard, you will make it. Most people who have made it have worked hard, right? Most people who have made it have worked hard, but there are many other people who are working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field that's been structured and perpetuated by racism, sexism, heterosexism, all of these systems of structured inequity. When we deny racism, we blame those who haven't made it for being lazy or stupid. And there are many ways to deny racism. The most prominent, some people say, I don't think racism exists, but even if we're working on diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, all of those things, if we work on those things and don't say the word racism, the ism piece is the system piece, then we're complicit because we're in a, a society with widespread racism denial, we're complicit with that racism denial. The myth of a zero sum game, if you gain, I lose, that fosters competition. The limited future orientation, the parts of the future we can touch today, each of us that will hopefully survive us are the children and the planet. In this country, we have a disregard for the children and a usurious relationship with the planet. The myth of American exceptionalism, this myth that the US, we say American, we really mean US, is so ordained by God that we, you know, are entitled to all of this vaccine that we have here and that there's nothing that we can learn. And white supremacist ideology, that is the first, the founding value, but I put it last in this list so you could keep listening to me. But this is the false idea of a hierarchy of human valuation by race. There is no such hierarchy. The false notion that not only is there a hierarchy, 
but that would put white people at the top as the ideal or the norm, but that has given many people who are living as white a sense of entitlement. It has resulted in the devaluation and dehumanization of people of color and fear at the browning of America that underlies a lot of our political divide today. So what can we do today? Going back to that image, we should actively look for evidence of two-sided science. Don't be reassured that things look open to you. Look for, are there, is there evidence of some two-sided sign operating by race, by gender, by immigration, by language, uh, you know, by urban, rural, zip code, whatever, looking not only at outcomes, but also at opportunity structures. We need to burst through our bubbles of experience to experience our common humanity, to know that just across town, there are people who are just as kind, funny, generous, hardworking, smart as we are, who are living in different circumstances. Because once we experience that common humanity, we can start building common cause. We need to be interested in the stories of others, believe the stories of others, and then join in the stories of others. See the absence of who's not at the table, what's not on the agenda, what policies are not in place that have put a place to be more just. We need to reveal inaction in the face of need because that's how structural racism very often shows to, up today. But all the powers, not just on those inside the restaurant, those on the outside need to know our power, we need to recognize that action is power. And especially, as I said before, collective action is power. And oh my God, I've gone over. I hope that um, there is time for a few questions. I have a few minutes if you have a few minutes to stay on. Thank you. Dr. Jones. Thank you for that inspiring talk. Um, and I know that I'm not alone in wishing that we could talk for hours on end. Um, we have already received several comments of gratitude and appreciation and as well as several questions. So thank you for agreeing to stay a little bit beyond nine o'clock. Yes. Um, you know, and this is, this is in reference, I think, to what just happened in Boston. Karen Garcia asks, how do we protect employees and colleagues that are actively working to make anti-racist change within healthcare organizations? So um, speak up on their behalf, uh, join with them, <laughs> you know? Um, so write op-eds and stuff and, and, and join in the work, join in the work. I actually have four, um, four things that each of us can do as social justice warriors. I call them my four BCs, you know, the letter B, the letter C, and these are habits of mind for social justice warriors. So that's a good answer to this question. The first is be courageous, right? So speak your truth, which, which Michelle Morris and Bram Whis Whispoe and all the others are doing. So be courageous, speak your truth. Um, well, let me say the four, be courageous, be curious, be collective and build community. If you wanna hear more about the details of the be courageous, be curious, be collective and build community, ask me separately. I don't want to use the time. I want to answer other questions. But really, speak up. Speak up for them and start doing your own work. Um, you know, I, I love this work. So I just want to say, when, when geese fly in a V formation, you know why they fly in a V formation. The goose at the front is blocking the wind for those who come before behind them. And they're blocking the wind for those who come behind them. And I sometimes worry about that goose at the front. What happens when she gets tired? Does she just drop to the ground or fly off someplace random? And no, in geese, they, 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 the goose that was at the front flies in the behind and somebody else takes the, the lead. What we need to do is identify or develop our own flock, decide where are we flying and then take turns in leadership. So really what we need to do is to be part of that collective and understand that we, that it can't all be on one person and we're like in the back clapping. We need to take turns in leadership and in that way we will progress as a collective, as a community, as a flock without people dropping to the ground from fatigue or being shot off, you know. Great, thank you for that. We are all in this together, that's for sure. Um, Juan Carlos Bordes says, thank you so much for your work and asks, some argue that single identity efforts may further perpetuate the marginalization of those with intersecting identities, such as a black or African-American trans women. Can you share your thoughts on how racism at all three levels, um, heterosexism, genderism, and other systems of oppression interact? And do you see racism as the overarching root cause? Well, thank you for that um, question. The same definition that I gave for racism, a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on so-called race that unfairly disadvantages some, unfairly advantages others, and saps the strength of the whole society can be generalized to be a definition of any system of structured inequity. So what is sexism? That is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on, you fill in the blank, 
gender, that's a different axis of inequity that unfairly disadvantages some, unfairly advantages others, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. There are many axes of inequity operating in our society today, intersecting in communities and in individuals. I acknowledge the parallel structure for all of this, the parallel impacts for all of this. And, but when people ask me, why do you, Kamara, spend so much of your time on race as the axis of inequity and racism as a system? It is because racism is foundational in our nation's history, and yet many people are in staunch denial of its continued existence and profoundly negative impacts on the health and well-being of our nation. I actually think that all of us need to be at least actively anti-racism. And I don't say anti-racist because if you say anti-racist, people are like, oh, is she talking about me? <laughs> like, I am not confused. We are anti the system. We need to all at least be actively anti-racism, even as we engage around these other struggles. And to the extent that we're able to dismantle the mechanisms of racism, the other struggles will benefit as well. And so then even when you talk about, you know, the intersecting identities in people, so the, the black trans uh, person, the, the, the blackness in their experience is, is likely between black trans folks and white folks, white trans folks and other is, is still trumping. We talk about black disabled people, their experience is still compounded by the racism. So it's not even an additive. The, the intersectionality is in all of these things, uh, multiplicative, yes, but racism is so foundational and it's so denied, right? At least people can acknowledge sexism a little bit better, or they might acknowledge homophobia maybe a little bit better, but it's so entrenched in our society, foundational, and there's so much denial that I think we must at least be actively anti-racism, even as we engage in the other struggles. Wonderful. Well, I would love, if you wouldn't mind, we, we have another question I'd love to ask. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Oakes. What advice do you have for dealing with colleagues who are becoming more engaged in the conversation, but perhaps struggling with some white fragility and feeling these conversations are attacking staff, making them feel bad for treating people so poorly? This is from Joe Fakari. Thank you very much for the question. Oh, wow. So, 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 so first of all, being anti-racism or being for social justice or for all of these things. Like when you're for equity, that's not anti-white. So there's some people out, and I'm not saying this question was about those people, but there's some people who, who are like anti-critical race theory, who think that if you're talking about history, you're anti-white. If you're talking about equity, you're anti-white. You know, so, so first of all, I'm clear about that, but, um, oh, I had a, a, a the, the, the real answer, there are many institutions that are very well along, Stanford may be one, where you, you know, probably have something on your website. You have this new effort that is helping to bring me here to, along with the Medicine Grand Rosses, all of this. And then there might be people, people on the side saying, well, mm, I guess there's no room for white men here anymore or something like that. Or, you know, um, I have come to recognize recently that there in the current status quo, there is a polar tension between those who value comfort and those who value social justice. Those who value comfort are comfortable in the status quo. That's why they value comfort. They are like the ones sitting at the table of opportunity, eating inside the restaurant, born there, many of them, but some may have found their way in and not born there, but so happy, not even asking why aren't other people coming in. Not even, in fact, preferring that they didn't, not being satisfied with the conversation they're having, not thinking that somebody else coming in there could enhance their conversation, not even wondering how does the food get in, right? The same people who can't go in and eat are growing the food, bringing it in the back, cooking it <laughs> and serving it, but can't sit there and eat. But those are, they are comfortable and they heard tell. They might've heard there's some noise outside. What are those people saying? Black lives matter, don't they know all lives matter? And they heard tell that there's a two-sided sign going on, but they don't even want to go over there and peer at the other side of the sign, much less walk out and see what the people are talking about because it makes them uncomfortable. So those are those. The, and they value comfort. On the other side are those who value social justice and they value social justice for two reasons. They know there's a two-sided sign going on and they also know that it's sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Many of those people were born seeing the closed side of the sign, right? But not all, people could have been born inside the restaurant but they were the ones who were wondering why aren't other people coming in? They're the ones who are wondering what, what are those people saying? Those are the ones who are saying, I can't stay in this, in this restaurant forever. So they wanted to burst their bubbles. And when they went outside, then they saw the close eye. So I'm not saying your birth constrains you to be, 
you on one side or the other, right? But those on the outside who value social justice know that there's a two-sided sign going on. They acknowledge that racism and these other systems of structured inequity exist, and they recognize that it's sapping the strength of the whole society. In our current status quo, that's a tension between those. And the challenge is for an institution like Stanford Medicine to encourage more people to burst through their bubbles, to create opportunities for people to burst through their bubbles of experience, to experience our common humanity, go across town and stay a while type of thing, to, to be interested and believe and join in the stories of others, all of those things, so that more and more of Stanford Medicine values social justice and recognizes that until we have a just system, then we can't be about comfort. Because if you're comfortable in an unjust system or unjust system, you are against social justice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was a rant. <laughs> Dr. Jones. Oh, it's such a good question. It's such a good question. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, honestly, I could stay here all day, um, but I'm going to say thank you again and turn it over to Dr. Oaks to take us home. Thank you again. Thank you so oh, much. Wow, that was, that was just excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Really just an outstanding discussion. I, I just, it's just so wonderful to see how amazingly you were able to just make these very clear and descriptive connections between health disparities and racism. And it's just wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you, just, just to close us out, if you're interested in getting CME credit, um, please see the chat for instructions um, and you, you can use the text credit system with the activity code 41254, or you're, you're welcome to log into the Stanford CME website to claim your credit. And just again, to uh, emphasize that this presentation is um, really part of a long, um, it's, a, it's part of a monthly um, a sessions called Building a Culture uh, Equity Series. And we will be having another session in March with Mary Stutz. And there'll be the summit um, uh, in May. And I hope you will all uh, engage and uh, join us for that. There'll be wonderful leaders, both here at Stanford and nationally um, in health equity, um, who will be sharing wonderful insights. So again, thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, thank you to medicine department um, for uh, partnering with us to host this wonderful session.